Hi folks, welcome to the first five axis video here at Saunders Machine Works. I am beyond excited. Let's make this Arduino case. We're using three plus two positional five axis to get this done in basically one operation and learn. That was the name of the game. We're actually editing this video about a month after we filmed it and I can't tell you how nervous I was when I'm running this part. It was our first five axis part. I was worried about crashing and collisions and clearances and tool paths and stability and chatter and it's been a great learning experience partly because in watching this, this part is now so easy to me. We've since machined a true five axis turbo fan blade, which we've got a video coming out on that, and we've machined a V8 engine block just really pushing ourselves to the next limit. How do we learn? How do we embrace this technology? How do we do these five axis tool pass in Fusion 360? And I am completely hooked. Head over to the NYC CNC website. We've got some more information on this project. And for our pro members, we've got access to this CAD and CAM file. Alex, who's one of our college interns here at the shop, took an Arduino, threw in a breadboard, and came up with this Fusion 360 CAD design for our project. It's a really good example of a lot of modern manufacturing things with Fusion 360. Alex was working on this both here at the shop and on his own. I'm able to jump in and collaborate with him. But for me, it's not just the CAD, it's the tool paths. And Alex did a lot of the programming on this. We were able to collaborate on the tool libraries. And the key thing is, well, how do you do five axis tool paths? Well, this is just three plus two. So yes, it's true five axis in the sense that you are using all five positions or capabilities of the machine to hold the part, but really we're just reorienting the part. And Fusion makes it incredibly easy to do that. Here's all you've got to do. When you click on setup, we started with our part in the vise like this. We've got the Z pointed up and the X pointed to the right, just like you see here. Then anytime we want to tip the part over to on one of its side, let's say for example, as we want to face the right side of this part, well now we want this side to be up. So in that facing operation or in just about any operation in Fusion 360 CAM, head over to geometry, choose tool orientation, and you've got that same sort of work coordinate system set up that you see from your setups. And you'll notice now we've oriented that Z positive. It's just that simple. We're often doing the majority of the cam somewhere else. And then right before we post it, we load it up at the machine computer, take a last final look, post it out, hop into the Haas NetShare and copy that file over. We've got one of the Raptor vices here. We're using its built-in dovetails. I'm measuring my stock, making sure it's perfectly centered, not gonna clear, clamping that vise down, and let's probe our part in. So with the Haas machine here, we're making use of what are called dynamic work offsets. It's become standard in the five axis industry. And with dynamic work offsets, your coordinate system doesn't have to be the center of rotation like it used to be on older machines and older technology. We're starting off with our one inch Corloy Pro X Ripper end mill. We've had a lot of luck. In fact, we used this making the giant A for the Autodesk Cam Challenge project. And here we're running it without coolant, uh, mostly for video purposes, but because it's a through coolant tool, we can actually just use our Haas's through coolant air, which really helps not only get the chips out of there for filming, but with aluminum, you want to avoid getting it too hot because then it can turn gummy and weld up. But you can see it's just that easy. We're just rotating the part around on this three plus two tool pass to go ahead and deck this part down. As you can see, the way we are work holding this is just by using extra material. It's a pretty common workflow for five axis machining, whether you're in a proper vise or in a smaller dovetail or some other customized fixturing setup. And generally the cost of that extra material is negligible relative to its benefits, which give you access to the full part. There's even some examples of folks that are able to do six sided machining on five axis by using specialty tools or undercuts or positioning the part down and actually doing some surfacing on this underside before you tab it off. That's really cool. But I was really happy. I was very nervous that we would lose stability or rigidity or have chatter and we really just didn't. The Haas machine, the Trunnion, the tool pass were far less fragile than I was worried they might be. We're also starting to use some longer tools or longer gauge length tools because those longer gauge lengths help you avoid things like your Trunnion and your vise. And you can see in these, some of these orientations, it's not that bad, but you'll see later on in the video where we start diving into some pockets and even parting this part off, you are gonna run a lot closer to potentially colliding. We can actually pull in the model of not just our vise, but the whole five axis trunnion. And when we've got the correct gauge length and the correct 
holder, we can do a much, much better job of testing to see what our toolpaths are going to do in terms of collisions between this case, getting pretty close to our vice jaw and the collet nut. On this part, I did a lot of the work with the quarter inch end mill, mostly because I was trying to take it easy, thinking that tool pressure would cause more issues than it did. So we're going all the RPMs that we've got, 15,000, almost a thousand service feet per minute, four thou per tooth, 180 inches a minute, no problem whatsoever. Starting to get a little bit closer in terms of collisions. You can see, if you look to the right side of your screen, I'm holding the remote jog pendant. Uh, we've had this Haas for about two years. And I don't think I've ever picked that thing up. And to be honest, I don't really like it. But when you're running the fifth axis tool pass here and you need to look at the machine from a certain orientation, having the ability to hit feet hold um, and actually toggle the coolant on and off pretty quickly is really nice. So you can really see the part start coming to shape. And I tell you, I've held countless five axis parts at trade shows and other people's shops and, and I've always known what it is, but it wasn't until I made my first part that it really clicked just how absolutely transformational and amazing it is. And it reminds us to some of like our, the lean videos we've done on how we manage tools in our shop. And I've been a firm believer, you make better decision when the, t the right tool is at your disposal. And on certain parts where you've got two, three, four, seven setups, the ability to do it all at once in one setup is just absolutely amazing. The two of the other videos that we've got coming out as we start going through this series of learning five axis machining are making one of the wrists for the short circuit Johnny five uh, robot project that we're starting as well as making that V8 engine block. Lots of angles, so lots of positional work, but it's all really simple. It's just two axis or three axis machining after you reorient to that correct plane. But what I'm excited about for our business is the ability to use five axis for prototyping. So one and done, kind of get an idea, get a part made, see what it's like, but also production. We're trying to think of ways that we can move our mod vice systems over to either four or five axis because we make better parts. Your holding tolerance is better. You're reducing your setups, your fixtures. Really, I've become so excited about this because after you've done it, it just sinks in how absolutely amazing five axis is. We'll also throw a link in the video description. Rob Lockwood did a great HSM video series on talking about some five axis tips, tricks, and strategies. And one of the big themes in that video from Rob is don't use five axis. And he's right, when you don't need it, don't use it. But really what he's saying is don't overcomplicate things. Anytime you're doing true five axis, you've got more degrees of freedom, more things can go wrong. Here, what we're doing is generally rotating this trunnion to a position, and then the Haas trunnion actually has a, a break, so it's actually kind of locked in the place here, which is one reason why I think the rigidity is, is great and, and much better than I had thought. One of the other fun things about five axis is it really forces you to think about changing your tool path. So where do you machine certain areas first so that you maintain rigidity or stick out lengths? When you come back in and finish certain parts, face things off, Generally speaking, smaller diameter tools can generate those lower cutting forces. So you're gonna get more stable machining than say whipping a big face mill or a large diameter solid carbide tool across it, things like that. So we're just about done finishing up the majority of that first operation. And it, yes, it did take us a, a while to cam up this part. Uh, we've become a big fan of using the folders in Fusion 360. Really helps you organize your tool paths, especially when you've got a lot of different operations and you want to keep them within one setup. Also makes it easier to repost in batches if you're going back and forth the machine. And so while it did take us a while to get this set up, what amazes me is making the second one of these complete as a product ready to ship. If this were a product we had for sale, is cake. You're good to go. And then you start thinking about the next step of automation or palletizing this and the light bulbs start going off. So now we're what I call parting off the part. And there's a few different ways to do this. I'm not sure we're doing it the best way yet, but we have a quarter inch end mill parting from each side, leaving a small gap in the middle. And then we're actually coming back in one final operation and reducing that even a little bit further. You can get these down to be quite small and the part still holds on. You can also use a slitting saw to come at it from a different angle. And you can also do this same sort of part, but leave tabs or even better, leave tabs along two or three different planes. And that can prevent your part from drooping over when those tabs get as small as say five or 10 thousandths of an inch. Again, our first part ever, we were beyond happy with how well it went. We were taking it easy as we parted it off, also because it's a slotting operation and it's a much easier, especially with aluminum, to gum up your tooling. And you can see here, we weren't quite happy with how much we had left. I thought this is stronger than it needs to be. So back at it, we're thinning that wall down, 
think that's when we were adjusting that last toolpath we just looked at and we got it pretty thin. It's kind of a bragging rights contest of how thin can you make your tabs and still have the part hold on. I've seen a lot of them where you can just tear it off by hand, but I was pretty darn happy with that, how flimsy that was, and no problem on the tooling or adaptive. We're gonna go over some more tricks later in future videos about using stock to leave and strategies on stepping down, and uh, there's a lot to say about how you do your fixturing and 3D contouring to control how you start removing the material below that work holding your part but really fun stuff it's really got me fired up and energized about what the potential is here we're doing a quick setup for op 2 we're finding the bottom of our vise we're using the bottom of that as our z zero that way we don't have to worry about how tall our current part plus stock is setting the jaw as our y-axis using a one two three block for the stability we've got a little bit of overhang here so scoot it in just to make it fit so it can rotate all the way around. Ends up it didn't have to rotate. I'm just trying to be really, really careful. And just finding the x-axis of the part itself, the y and z were set from our vise. And that's what's so cool with this five axis work and dynamic work offsets, you don't even have to have your part square or centered, you just probe it in. Facing off the last of our Backside, doing some final cleanup passes. And we're done.